tonight on the Daily Debrief, a verdict in the murder for hire case that left a Dallas dentist dead. He was supposed to be paid in drugs and money. Friends say this ex-girlfriend wanted revenge. She was like obsessed with him. The man prosecutors say pulled the trigger, blamed other witnesses. Crystal Cortez is in here saving her butt. Plus, 10 suspected bombs sent to critics of President Trump and top Democrats. An FBI expert explains how the law enforcement investigation is likely unfolding. That's straight ahead on the Daily Debrief for Thursday, October 25th. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Daily Debrief. First tonight to that Texas trial where a defendant faces a possible death sentence. It's a complicated case, so let's break down the key players. Dallas area dentist Kendra Hatcher died in a September 2015 ambush. Authorities say Hatcher was dating this man, Ricardo Paniagua. The problem, he had a jealous ex-girlfriend. That ex-girlfriend was uh, this next woman we're going to talk about right now, Brenda Delgado. And authorities believe she was the mastermind who hired this defendant, Christopher Love, to rob and kill Kendra Hatcher. Love is the one whose fate jurors decided today. Crystal Cortez admitted to being the getaway driver. She pleaded guilty and testified against Love. The verdict in this case was guilty. During closing arguments today, prosecutors pointed to a recorded phone call. In that call, the defendant admitted he should have disposed of the murder weapon. That by itself lets you know that this man is the shooter. I could sit down right now on that alone, and that lets you know that this man is the man that walked up to Dr. Kendra Hatcher and shot her in the back of the head. But there's more to it than that. You know that he's part of the plan. The evidence in front of you is that they meet the middle of August in approximately a two-week time span. There are 111 texts or calls from him to Crystal Cortez. 111. Crystal calls and texts to him, 49. 111 to 49. Who seems to be the person eager to do this deal? That man right there. The defense shifted the blame towards the co-conspirators. You cannot find the defendant guilty upon the testimony of Crystal Cortez unless you first believe that her testimony is true. You must first believe her testimony is true. And that is where the state has problems in this case. Because we've heard the stories. We have two divergent stories about how this occurred. It's a little unusual in a capital murder case where we go almost a day and a half of testimony before you ever hear the name of the defendant brought up in this case. You heard from a lot of folks that have, that have never, I asked a couple, have you ever heard the name Christopher Love? No, I don't know nothing about that, none of this. But you heard the backdrop of Brenda Delgado. Brenda Delgado was in the process of trying to find somebody before she even met Crystal Cortez. Crystal Cortez is in here saving her butt. <clears throat> saving her butt in the fate that she deserves. The detective who interviewed defendant Christopher Love testified that there is no question this crime was premeditated. Was it clear to you that this was planned out? Yes, sir. Was it clear to you that this had been planned out for some period of time? Yes, it was. Do you have an opinion as to whether or not, at this point in your career, this is one of the most planned out murders you've had to investigate? It definitely is. And based on the evidence and investigation that you gathered, was Christopher Love involved in the planning? I have no doubt that Christopher Lowe was heavily involved in the plan and his offense. The detective asked that same uh, person uh, exactly how she got off the hook with a much lighter sentence while Christopher Love faced possible execution. This young lady who was instrumental in this plan long before any involvement by Christopher Love, she scooted out of this thing with a 35-year sentence. She'll be out of here in less than 20 years, won't she? 
I don't know how long. I think some of that depends on her act, how she acts while she's incarcerated. I understand. Brenda Delgado and, and, and Crystal Cortez, they look for somebody to participate in this whole situation. They look for a way to backtrack and cover their, their activities as, as good as possible, didn't they? They did definitely uh, manipulate the circumstances. Ms. Hatcher's life was, go, was, was virtually over from the moment that Brenda Delgado decided she was going to ask whoever it took as long as it took to find someone to cause her harm, if that's what she wanted to do. I don't believe that. Well, she was asking everybody she could think of, wasn't she? That's correct, but it still had to take someone willing to pull the trigger, willing to take her life for it to happen. And in fact, we had Crystal Cortez, who by her own admission, she was absolutely willing to do it. She was going to do it for virtually nothing, wasn't she? Yes. But she described for you her actions on that day when she decided that she was going to go over there and do this on her own, didn't she? She did mention that during one of her interrogations. Many questions there about Crystal Cortez. She pleaded guilty, accepted a 35-year sentence, admitted her role in the murder plot, and named Christopher Love as the trigger man. Were you an integral part of the planning of this offense? Yes, I was. Were there ideas or things about how this should happen that were your ideas? Yes. Such as? Um, putting the gloves on, um, finding the weapon, uh, pretty much um, following Kendra Hatcher. Probably two weeks after I met Brenda, we started planning this um, murder. Um, we would follow Miss Kendra. We would um, stake out her apartment. We would um, sit in the parking garage. Kendra, I mean, we would follow her from her job to her house. We pretty much um, just found out her daily routine. Uh, one of the plans were to inject her um, with the needle. Another plan was to shoot her directly, and um, another plan was to kidnap her. And did Mr. Love have a plan that he preferred? Um, he pretty much said that it would be easier just to kill her with the gun. Cortez went on to describe a practice run of the murder and how the defendant expected payment in return for making the job look like a robbery gone bad. There was no disagreement on how much he was supposed to be paid. He was supposed to be paid in drugs and money. Do you remember the specific amounts um, of drugs and money? I remember that we purchased Kush and cocaine for him, and she paid him in cash. But I don't remember the amounts. Do you remember him agreeing to those payments? Yes, sir. It was planned to be a murder and to look like a robbery gone bad. He was supposed to take her belongings and k kill her at the same time. What kind of belongings? A purse, cell phone, if possible, anything that was in the car. The defendant himself talked to the police. First, he claimed he had absolutely no connection to the crime. Then he acted out what happened. Like most other interrogations, this recording is a bit hard to hear, but you'll get the picture. So she's sitting right here. I opened the door. She was getting my stuff out when I was in there. She was getting my door open. Her door's open. My door was cracked. Her door was cracked. So she's sitting here wrapping her stuff like this. And what happened then? I opened the door, and then when she she jumps up and starts pulling her stuff. Yeah. You trying to you trying to reach up here and just grab her? I ain't I ain't have a chance to reach. Cause as soon as you look, she was on the door. She like she seen me and so I get my stuff. She was screaming. Mm -hmm. So I, like, shifted my way. It's like I slammed the door and just, give me this. I turned around because I heard the truck. I was going to go back to the truck. When I turned around, the truck was banging up right there. So I just opened the door, I threw that shit in there, and I was getting in. I heard a shot. The boyfriend testified that he had no clue what his jealous ex was plotting. He told the jury about trying to find his girlfriend amid a, pol a flurry, rather, of police activity. I was brought to the front desk, and um, I was asked if I can get buzzed up to uh, Kendra's apartment. And then uh, the concierge, uh, John, he held up his hand, and he said, hold on. And... 
that's the, that's the moment when everything everything just kind of started coming together as far as you know the the police vehicles not being able to get a hold of her. I mean now I'm now I'm thinking worst case scenarios and um, I'm just repeating myself. You know where, where's Kendra? Where's Kendra? I need to I need to talk to I need to see her. You know please, you know buzz me up to her apartment. I was texting her. I said you know they're not letting me up to your apartment. Please let me in and. Um, and then that's when they brought me to the to the back area of the concierge front desk, and um, a team of investigators and police officers were there. And the concierge, it was John. He was the one that actually, because I kept asking repeatedly, you know, is um, you know is is Kendra okay? Is Kendra okay? Did you know is she still? And then I became even more specific. I said, is she is she still alive? And um, and John said, no, I'm sorry, Kendra passed. The victim's mother described early on in the trial how she heard of her beloved daughter's passing. My husband, he had to drive two hours to get home that night, and Jamie wouldn't tell me, and Jeff wouldn't tell me anything. And I thought at first it was Dave, but they're like, no, Mom, no, Mom, just sit here until Dave gets here. And so when my husband got there, I'm sorry, um, he came in the door, and Jamie had me on the couch, and he said, she said, Mom, it's Kendra. And I said, no, no, not Kendra. And and they said she was shot. And I'm like, what? What do you mean she shot? And Jamie said she didn't make it. And I... That's all I really remember. I I remember that so well. Here for analysis on the Daily Debrief, Law and Crime Senior, uh, or Editor-in-Chief, excuse me, I'm thinking of Ron Blitzer. Editor-in-Chief, Rachel Stockman here. So so it's just heartbreaking to listen to that mother tell that story about waiting for family to gather and then hearing this awful news. It certainly is. It, you know, I have to say, in terms of the verdict in this case, I'm not particularly surprised because there was just so much evidence uh, and firsthand account witnesses really leading folks to believe that Delgado did, in fact, hire this guy, Christopher Love, to murder that young woman who you see in the picture. And it is, it's just such a tragic story because in so many ways, um, she's just a, such an innocent victim in all of this. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the boyfriend had some contact with the ex because apparently back when the, the boyfriend and the ex were dating, they had taken out some kind of a joint phone account together and they, they were still sort of coordinating, you know, paying for the bills and things like that. So, so he did have some contact with the ex, but he said he had no idea that she was plotting this whole thing. Yeah, and and um, it will certainly be interesting as we head into Monday and we get into the death penalty phase of this. What's going to end up happening? What witnesses the defense or prosecution are going to bring forward, and whether the jurors are going to move to uh, bring this man to face the death penalty? Because this would be the first death penalty case sent from Dallas County since. 2013. It's been a little while down there in Texas. A couple of defense theories that fell flat here. One of them was uh, the defense kind of pushing back, saying this was supposed to be some kind of a robbery. Uh, the prosecution pushed back and said, hey, wait a minute. If this no was supposed way. to be a robbery, right. why were you trailing her for two weeks before the actual shooting? That's not a robbery. Well, you could say this was supposed to be a robbery to scare her but not kill her, and it was plotted for a while, but I don't think ultimately the jurors really bought that at all. You know, the question of punishment is going to be an interesting one. I know you brought that up a couple of minutes ago because the state called this a so-called execution. The trajectory of the bullet from the back of the victim's head coming out to just below the jaw area in that general area, that sounds like an execution-style uh, shot. As to the punishment, is this death penalty worthy? Is, is this defendant just so loathsome that he deserves that punishment, or is he the kind of guy who was just kind of carrying out orders See, to, that, feed, that's how I to fe feed some kind of an addiction because they were going to give him drugs and money for, for he, doing this? Yeah, I don't know if... The, listen, it's horrible what he did. Horrible. Um, but in terms of scale, when we look at the other death penalty cases that we see, this guy was very much 
acting at the direction of Delgado. And if you know the synthesis of this case, you know that she ended up escaping to Mexico. And as part of her extradition agreement, she cannot face the death penalty here. So here's the man who, you know, was part of the scheme that was really hatched by this other woman who is not facing the death penalty, but this man is. So I'm not sure if he should be put to death. I'm and, not you know, sure. The, the defense brought that up very, very thoroughly <laughs> here. You know, the prosecution said, look, uh, jurors, don't worry about Delgado. She will face her own punishment when we get to her. You have to worry about this man and this man alone. That seems like a reasonable argument. Yeah, it certainly does. But we'll continue to watch and see what happens in this case. Certainly an interesting one. Yeah, a lot to break down here. And again, that death penalty phase will pick up on Monday. Still ahead tonight on the Daily Debrief, Casey Anthony's father has some advice for his daughter on her plans to have another child of her own. First, at least 10 crude explosives sent to prominent Democrats, Democratic Party donors, critics of President Trump, even to CNN. A former FBI counterterrorism expert joins us with some insight on criminal invest on the cl criminal investigation that's unfolding as we speak. That's when we return on the Daily Debrief. Welcome back, everyone. Suspected bombs this week addressed to a number of top Democrats, critics of President Trump, even to CNN, have grabbed headlines as pictures of bomb squad vehicles dragging the devices from locations around America have played over and over again. Behind the scenes, though, is a criminal investigation. Who sent the devices and what charges could that person or persons face? Joining me tonight is former FBI counterterrorism agent and explosives expert Rick Hahn. Rick, good to see you here on The Daily Debrief. Thank you, Aaron. A pleasure Every, to be here. Everyone's speculating about this, but I want to focus a little bit on the legal investigation here. So based on your experience, how could we suspect that to be proceeding? Well, at this point in time, I'm sure all the devices that have been recovered are in the hands of the FBI Laboratory Explosives Unit. Um, I'm sure they're being analyzed, and all of the uh, material that comprises the device, everything from the tape, the pipe, whatever fillers may be in it, uh, the envelopes themselves, the stamps on the envelopes, all that is being analyzed in the FBI laboratory. And, uh, th you know, these devices have a lot of good forensic evidence. So where does it go from there? I mean, certainly they have to defuse these devices. They're certainly testing for everything, I have to presume, from DNA to fingerprints, if those things are to exist on these things, trying to get some kind of a sense of exactly who's sending them. Well, exactly. And uh, the good news is that there were some of them that went through the mail service, and uh, going through the mail service, they know exactly where they're dropped. Um, even if they were put into a box, which they may have been, um, they're still going to be able to identify where that box is and then pick up video from commercial places, maybe even traffic cams that may tell us exactly who is behind this. Now, certainly that part of the investigation has to be moving along pretty quickly. They can do that even though there's, for instance, no tracking number on these? That's correct. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, your postal uh, markings on them does tell you exactly where it was canceled the, at the first location that it went through. So they can determine exactly where this thing came from. Yeah, certainly uh, plenty of interviews going on right now. Uh, a lot of people speculating about this. Uh, a lot of high-profile targets here. We've got the Clintons, we've got the Obamas, we've got George Soros, we've got a CNN analyst. Does that affect the investigation and how? Well, only in, uh, first of all, let me back up and say, we don't really know that these are real devices at this point in time. And I think that's a critical factor uh, for the investigators. If they are, in fact, hoax devices, that's one thing. If, in fact, they're real devices, that's another thing. Um, and, of course, the consequences of the two are not all that different, frankly, but, you know, in terms of prosecution. But in terms of conducting the investigation, it means a lot. Well, certainly it would affect how the devices are handled, uh, for sure. As to the charges that, that uh, the individual or individuals could face here if caught, uh, how would something like that affect the charging? Does that go uh, through your mind when you're looking into cases like this? Um, absolutely. 
the fact of the matter is, is if it's not actually an explosive device, if it's a hoax device, uh, the charges are going to be somewhat different. But the fact of the matter is, is that even as a hoax device, the, the, the penalties can be very severe. And clearly, if it is a hoax device, it's designed to have that same sort of impact of intimidating people. And there are odd things about these devices. For example, typically a package bomb is something that is designed to function when the person opens the package. These seem to have had some sort of timer or something on them. And that's very unusual for a package bomb. It's interesting that you bring that up, Rick. I was wondering that myself because a number of years ago in a previous life as a local news reporter, I, I met a member of the Unabomber's family, and he was giving a joint discussion along with uh, a uh, one of the victims of the Unabomber. And the victim said, you know, the minute I touched the package, I heard a click, and then I don't remember anything. And certainly that was the point when the explosion hit. So, so these are different. You know, what, what's the deal with the timer? I mean, can, can someone sending something like this actually predict when it's going to arrive uh, if it just goes through regular first-class mail and then hope that the timer is accurate? No, of course not. You know, and, that, and that's, again, it, it's an unusual factor here, um, why there's a timer on this thing. Uh, it makes me think that this is a probably a hoax device. The, another unusual factor about it is that there's wire going into both ends of the, the pipe. There's really no reason to do that. Uh, so there's, the, again, the jury's out on this at this point. We don't really know enough facts here. Um, but the fact that uh, there seems to be too much postage on them, um, the fact that names are misspelled, those are all things that are taught to mail handlers, to commercial people that handle mail commercially, that these are warning signs that there's, you know, maybe a dangerous package. Um, it's and so it, it, uh, it, it does get, uh, it, it does raise the suspicion here. It's kind of interesting that these things ultimately wound up at their targets. Really appreciate you being with us, Rick Hahn. FBI counterterrorism agent and explosives expert. I know you're going to be following this very, very closely as it unfolds. Certainly. Thank you very much, Aaron. Thanks a lot for being on the debrief. We're going to wrap things up for the evening here on the Daily Debrief. A reminder that we have a lot of cases that we're continuing to follow, including that penalty phase in the Love case, which we expect will continue starting on Monday. Will the defendant get the death penalty? For now, this is Aaron Keller, and for everyone here at the debrief, have a good evening.